long time, so giving us um, a wider a wider scope in terms of his research across the globe. His main work is on the relations between vocational and higher education in Aotearoa, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, the UK and USA, and looking at the relationship between post-secondary education and work in the different countries that he works in. As you'll notice, you'll just have a little um, icon appear, which notes that this session is being recorded. If you click continue on the blue button, that shows that you're happy for that to continue and that this can be used as a resource for later. We've had a list of comments and questions that the panelists have had, and I'm sure that they will also appear in the chat box. Um, so if you have further, further questions, then just raise your hand and we'll take those. Um, and what we'd like to do first is to hear from our panelists that's why we're, why we're here and then to have a good lively discussion. We are due to finish at 5pm, which we will on time. So we'll take it if that's okay with everybody around the table and everyone's looking like their Wi-Fi is working and everything's good. So if we start with Toby Perkins MP and then to Dr Clancy and then we'll move to Gavin Moody if that is okay in that order. So enough of the intros, let's get cracking over to Toby Perkins please. Well, thanks ever so much, Alison. And, and if I could start by just thanking all of your members, because I know what an incredibly difficult uh, last, uh, how long is it, 13 months or so, uh, we have all experienced. I think uh, the further education sector ha has had many, many years um, of an incredibly challenging environment. A sense that uh, it's been the Cinderella service of uh, education, that it's been underfunded, not since it's been underfunded, very clearly underfunded, and, and adult education particularly so. Um, and on the back of that, uh, all uh, educationalists have, have had an incredibly difficult time uh, over the course of the last 13 months, not just um, in terms of the stresses that we've all had, uh, coping with uh, coronavirus and, and the limitations on our lives and uh, and all of the problems that caused, but also um, being upfront and, and very personal with uh, the challenges that uh, their students are facing, um, both in terms of being able to uh, access the learning, but also all of the um, societal and, and mental health challenges that uh, that have come as a result of uh, attempting to uh, carry on and, and uh, the pressures to catch up uh, that have, uh, have come through this, uh, through the coronavirus crisis. And, uh, and I think even during coronavirus, when government have been claiming that they would do everything that they can, when it comes to things like catch up funding, when it comes to things like laptop provision, further education has still once again uh, felt uh, understandably uh, that it's uh, very much uh, uh, at the end of the queue when it comes to being supported. So I want to thank everyone in this sector because, as Alison said, um, it is a sector that means a, a huge amount to me. Uh, it, she mentioned, I think, the contribution that it meant to uh, another panelist family, but but also my son, who, who's just in the process now um, of completing his master's at Holy University. Um, but there is no doubt in my mind that without his three years in further education, uh, that he would never even have gone on to higher education. And, and uh, further education is, is absolutely a, a provider of second chances, uh, as Alison referred to. It's something I say rarely because I think it's so important that there's so many people in government whose, whose lives have, have taken, you know, fairly uh, gentle um, paths and uh, often... Um, being from, you know, very expensive schools to very high profile universities into high profile jobs uh, and haven't really come into contact uh, with the kind of uh, lives that many people in, in our further education sector uh, have lived. Uh, and, and the reality is there are people who come out of um, uh, our schools without the skills they need. And often, uh, in so many cases, we see that it's the further education sector that, that um, uh, reintroduces uh, in the love of learning that reaches the parts uh, that our school sector can't. And that's why I say that to have a successful further education policy, you need not only 
the policies, but you need to, to have a, a sense of the soul of further education and a sense uh, of, of what further education really is all about. Um, so uh, I, I think that that's incredibly important uh, as a starting point. It's given me a huge amount of talk about um, catch up and, and of course, uh, it is incredibly important. I think we need to recognize before we even start uh, thinking about how we catch up uh, the learning that has been lost. Um, both the uh, social uh, deficit that's been left as a result of the coronavirus crisis, and also the extent to which the further education sector was already playing, uh, probably with one hand tied behind its back, because um, we've seen over the course of 11 years, um, real terms funding cuts of up to 50% in adult education, around 30% in further education, um, and a real sense of, uh, I think that what further education is all about, um, which is about widening people's opportunities. Um, and it's about so much more than simply giving people the skills they need in order to get their next job. Um, has been somewhat lost over, over the course of these uh, last 10 years. Um, and so, you know, when you understand that the uh, average student within our, uh, within the UK, uh, further education sector will, will have probably as much as 35% less contact time uh, than they would have in amongst any of our OECD competitors. You realise already that funding crisis uh, has a real consequence uh, for learners and, and for the wider uh, skills environment. And when you look at some of the uh, things that the government are coming forward with, um, I, I think there's still uh, whilst it's welcome that they're talking more about further education now, uh, there is still a lot of holes uh, in, in those uh, policies. I think, for example, the Lifetime Skills Guarantee, which is a reintroduction of, of the previous uh, arrangement that uh, existed under the Labour government in the first couple of years of the coalition government. Um, but the Lifetime Skills Guarantee leaves something like 30% of all jobs out of it. If you already have a level three qualification, you're not able to get funded uh, for a new level three qualification. So whilst it's been introduced a policy that will enable people to move out of sectors that are no longer attracting into, into new sectors, it, it actually does do that if you've already qualified at level three and you look at apprenticeship levy, which again, you would think, you know, Labour politician would certainly welcome uh, employers being forced into contributing towards the skills of the next generation. And as a principle, it's a perfectly reasonable one. But when it's accompanied with a massive reduction in the contribution that government make um, to, uh, to apprenticeships funding, when it sees a reduction in the number of apprenticeships, when it sees a big reduction in the number of 16 to 19 year olds doing apprenticeships, when more and more of that funding then being spent on level six and seven managerial uh, training rather than uh, on introduced people into the uh, workplace. Um, and you see that it's uh, a policy that shuts huge amounts of uh, small and medium sized businesses out because of the complexity and because they won't have a funding pot. Uh, and when you see finally that 330 million pounds that have been put into the apprenticeship levy pot in the year before coronavirus are sent back to the treasury unspent, then you have a policy that is not delivering uh, on what it says that it should do. Um, and so fundamentally feel that the government's recent uh, skills white paper um, is in some ways lacking the scale and the ambition that's required, um, both as a result of the funding cuts of the last 10 years and because of the additional pressures caught by, cor by coronavirus. But actually in some areas, actually marching proudly in the wrong direction rather than simply um, being uh, not entirely adequate. I think that there's obviously got to be a need for employers to be part of, uh, uh, of the conversation on skills, but the government's sense that employers have to be in the driving seat, I don't think it uh, either makes um, education or academic sense, or necessarily is what businesses themselves want. Uh, they want their voice to be heard, they want an understanding of what, uh, of, of what uh, they need, but they don't want, uh, I believe, or are capable of most in many cases. Um, to be the organisation driving that, uh, that kind of academic delivery. They're too busy running their own businesses uh, as it is. And when you look at sectors like the construction sector, 
where it's predicted that we have 44,000 too few people doing apprenticeship every year in order to keep pace with the scale demand. You can see that this employer-led approach is failing to uh, deliver the apprenticeship that we need. So I very much look forward to hearing from your other panelists, uh, Alison, uh, and from um, uh, the other people who are contributing and answering um, the questions that are being provided on this. As you can see, I think there's many ways in which the government needs to change direction. Uh, and the recent decision um, to uh, abandon union is just one example uh, of the ways in which government's uh, approach to uh, skills uh, is not in any way matching the rhetoric. Um, and finally, I would just bring people's attention to Labour's proposal, proposal for an apprenticeship wage subsidy. Um, it's our view that there is a particular crisis right now in terms of apprenticeship and that the current government uh, incentives are, um, are welcomed by businesses that will like to take apprentices anyway, but are not enough to actually make difference to the number of apprentices uh, that are being taken on. Uh, and we have a specific proposal, which I'm happy to discuss in more detail, to uh, bring uh, a wage subsidy from government funded by this £330 million that was unspent last year and to fund uh, apprenticeships, 85,000 apprenticeships for 16 to 24 year olds uh, over the course of the next six months. So um, that, that is something I'd be happy to discuss more and very much look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you very much, Toby. Thanks for that really <laughs> quick, quick whip through. I mean, you know, absolutely. And funding is at the heart of heart of things. You know, we can't have professionals around the table and um, you're no doubt aware we're in the middle of a, a, a bid for a, a proper pay round for our FE colleagues this year. So let's hope the, uh, you know, we finally put our money where our mouth is for the professionals that we absolutely need around the table. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Clancy, are you ready? You look like you are. Over to you. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. I think um, someone was going to share my PowerPoint slides for me, so um, I'll try not to go on too long <laughs> on the slides front. Um, I don't want to do death by PowerPoint, but I just try, wanted to give you a kind of historical perspective as someone who's been both a researcher around adult in particular as well as further education, but also to think about how we seem to have lost entirely the language of emancipatory adult education and the importance of skills for life. Um, this is really where I want to take up on the, the white paper. So just to say, just to give a brief historical perspective on adult education. So the paper that we all refer to and, 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 and has been a seminal document for at least the last hundred years now, uh, was the 1990 Ministry of Reconstruction report on adult education. This was an incredible report because it focused at a time of great crisis, immediate post, uh, post the Great War, and concluded that liberal, non-technical adult education was really essential for every member of the society that we live in, for all, us, all members of the community. And they stated that adult education was a permanent national necessity an inseparable aspect of citizenship and therefore should be both universal and lifelong. So this has been essentially the kind of um, mark or the, the, the benchmark by which uh, most adult educators have worked and thought for the last hundred years within, increasingly, within an increasingly different, difficult context. And it's interesting that the, the report emphasised two key intertwining strands, and I think these are really important. So one, recognising that all human beings have the need for the satisfaction of intellectual, aesthetic and spiritual needs from all backgrounds, all people, but also the need for us to have a civic uh, strand to adult education. And this is about enabling ourselves to be better fitted for the responsibilities of membership in political, social and industrial organisations. In other words, being critical, being able to think critically about the world in which we live. This seems to be increasingly a lost world. And this is the one that we, in particular in the, in the Centenary Commission, tried to really emphasise. So the report really ushered in legislation which enabled local authorities, particularly the voluntary sector, and this is really important, they saw them as being better equipped often to respond to and work with adult and community learners. 
um, but they 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 engaged with trade unions, adult residential colleges, university extramural departments, the WEA, cooperative movement, etc. And they were concerned to transform the lives, aspirations, communities, and experiences, particularly of working class people who had little access to education of this kind at the time, and arguably in many ways still. So could I move on to the next slide, please? So, <clears throat> yeah, so our, ours was, our, our anniversary uh, report came out in November, 2019, at the 100 year anniversary. We wanted to try and create something called adult education for our times. We wanted to build, which continues a campaign for adult education, really trying to look at policy now, but also uncover this often lost history and the immense impact of adult education. And we, we were particularly keen to focus on key themes, which are contemporary issues, but also reflect some of the issues that were taking place even a hundred years ago. So we can see now the impact of the destruction of adult and further education infrastructure, which Toby's talked about, the changing nature of work, the increasing precarity, the increasing difficulty in accessing work, uh, fragmented communities and disrupted civic society. We see this wherever we look. Polarised democracies, a massive growing problem with inequality in the UK, shamefully. Lifelong learning and civic rhetoric, but little action or funding that ever goes with that. So lots of fine talk, no action and very little funding. Can I move on, please? So I just wanted to say a few, without trying to be utterly depressing, words about the current status of adult education more broadly. So we know from numerous reports, MAM, many other reports, that lifelong learning has a profound effect on individual lives and communities, but it's political, social, economic, and educational. It's all those aspects. And we know despite this growing em emphasis in, within the European Union since the 1990s, about the wider benefits of adult learning, that successive governments and many policymakers over the last three decades have just continually failed to grasp any conception of learning, learning beyond skills in the workplace. And we're seeing an increasingly market-driven perspective on education. We know that civic and community learning has particularly suffered during the COVID pandemic, despite people's incredible and creative um, efforts to, to keep that alive, often online and in very difficult circumstances. But community le learning participation has decreased by almost 50% um, in 2019, 2020. We know that the residential adult education colleges, which my father was fortunate enough to go through as a minor who went to Ruskin, <clears throat> are starting to dwindle in number from a healthy 35 post-war to a, a, a now, now three that are still traditionally what we might consider to be um, independent residential adult education colleges. We're losing that incredible history increasingly, their links with the trade union and labor movements, <clears throat> the promotion in, an, in a residential setting of liberal education for working class students recruited mainly from the trade unions. So often the root, of course, of MPs in the past too, but we don't see this, this link and relationship anymore. Uh, next slide, please. And so we see an enormous decline in part-time and mature students across England. And this is both HE and FE. So between a drop of half, of half, as I think Toby said, um, by 2016-17, between 2006 and 7, so in that, that 10 year period, in colleges of FE, numbers of adults plummeted on FE courses, um, falling from 3.16 million to 2.18 million, and that's in 2017-18. So we see also that uh, data published reports that public, Participation by adults in further education and skills for the first two quarters of the 2020-21 academic year have also started to decline and by 10.5%. Adult government funded further education and skills participation decreased by 15% in that same period. So just moving on, thanks. And we know that part-time and mature learners in particular come from, are more likely to come from disadvantaged backgrounds than those who enter higher education straight from school. We also know that part, the adult learners are far more likely to study part-time. 
And we see a dramatic decline in part-time numbers, as I've said, shows no sign of leveling off, and in fact is likely to, to become more exaggerated. Thank you. So just to say a little bit about the FE sector, it has had a, a long and proud history of serving local people and of responding to both industry and technical needs, but also the needs of local people in terms of their wider educational aspirations and ambitions and needs. And so before the 1944 Education Act, many people left school at 14, as people will know, and we were often to contribute to the family needs. The Education Act meant that attendance in full-time education, 15 to 18 year olds, would no longer be entirely voluntary. We saw this huge boom between the 50s and the 70s in the FE sector, and this major white paper in 1956. <clears throat> and FE colleges have built historically very strong links with local businesses and employers. And it's arguable that the, the really successful FE colleges of the 1980s were those where vocational and academic skills were combined and given equal status, which has been a continual complexity in terms of how these are respectively perceived. We then had the 1992 FNHE um, Act, which removed colleges from local education control and incorporation, which brought this notion of senior management control, uh, new sources of finance, and this very much commercialization, which started to come in uh, for colleges and providers. Thank you. So we see a decline in the number of FE colleges across England between um, over the last decade, in particular since the 1990s. So a drop from 500 to 257. We see typical FE courses for 16 to 19 year olds being mainly now around business studies, health, social care, travel, tourism, et cetera, <clears throat> and some HNC type work. In addition, we see, of course, really important course provision around ESOL and access type courses. But the second chance academic subject route has been largely driven out of FE and into school six forms. And we're starting to see this increasing focus on technical education level four and above. Thank you. So my argument really around the white paper skills for jobs is that it tends to give the private sector an increasingly dominant role in the skills agenda in total contradiction to what we've been saying in the Centenary Commission about the need for much more democratically accountable FE systems. So some of the um, massive inequalities in, F in the FE sector are more exposed to community scrutiny. The private sector's focus is around skills training particularly these notion, notional local skills development plans. And it's also about some notion of how we fill skills gaps. Uh, additional strategic development funding will be used to set up business centers, but the emphasis is entirely on higher level technical skills, higher level, level apprenticeships. And we know that just over one in 10 of all starts with few opportunities um, are, are being offered for school or college leavers. And we're saying too that employers, not colleges, often initiate apprenticeships. And in, unlike in the post-war period, deindustrialization has meant that many employers neither need or want um, apprenticeships. So the, this issue is being fudged and continually ignored. Just moving on, I'm nearly done. <laughs> so we're seeing an increasing privatization of further education. We see in the involvement of companies in new industrial developments, what will be the implication of these profit-led initiatives on local economic activities and the lack of democratic accountability. So we have institutes of technology and I've, I've taken some of this from the recent um, post 16 educator report, which is brilliant on, on the white paper. So an anecdotal account from Queen Mary University stood talking about a relationship being developed with Siemens, very complicated partnership process, achieving joined up provision is a bureaucratic nightmare. This indicates that setting up private sector and college partnerships will almost certainly be difficult. And then there's the wider question of whether colleges should be in partnership with companies which are involved, for instance, in the military industrial complex and other unethical work. Next one, please. 
So I just have numerous concerns really about the implications of a narrow employer-led skills um, agenda. It's, it's really about short-term needs of business, but we're not seeing this notion of longer-term holistic planning for the locality or the region. Fewer opportunities for local communities to influence the skills agenda. And then we have the wider implications about the loss of democratic influence in skills and training at regional and local level. And this is particularly important, I believe, at the, in the post-COVID period. We seem to have lost track entirely of these, the kind of humanitarian strand um, of adult education that I described right at the start. Next one, please. Yeah, no, finished. I think that's it, is it? Oh yeah, great. <laughs> right, so I just wanted to say that the recommendations from the uh, from our report, just uh, very briefly, was that the there should be a strengthened democratic accountability for further education colleges to their communities, and that they should be mandated to have representation on the boards from local authority, community organisations, trade unions. We also said that a funding of 250 million per annum should provide should be provided to adult education and restored to local authorities. And we also believe passionately that funding for adult community education services and FE colleges should be in, in, increased at least by one billion per annum. I don't think we've actually managed to achieve any of that, but we do keep trying and we continue to fight the corner for a, a broader conception of adult um, education and further education. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that's to um, sort of book, book, bookend the beginning and the end <laughs> and the, the kind of current point of uh, my, my career in, in FE and we've seen everything that you, you know, you've gone through. It's uh, you know, just down the road, we used to have community, community education for IT, you know, getting older people onto IT and, you know, so much has been lost. Uh, thank you. Uh, and Gavin Moody looks like he's ready. He's checked his lighting and good to go by the looks. All good on your end? Yes, thank you, uh, Alison, and uh, thank you for your interest, colleagues from Toronto, as the locals call it, where Environment Canada forecasts it will snow this evening. So um, I um, plan to um, talk about uh, skills for jobs. And I've called it reskilling because I do not believe it is an adequate foundation for upskilling. I plan to um, outline three uh, flaws or limitations in the report. There are many others, and perhaps there are some good bits, but um, uh, being a scholar, I start with the critical uh, points. Um, I'm a Melbourne boy, and if you went to one of the smarter cafes in Melbourne, you wouldn't ask for a long black or a cappuccino or a noisette or anything. You would ask for a coffee, and you would get this, a deconstructed coffee. And you then um, make your, uh, your mix your coffee as the occasion suits. And likewise, I plan to spend um, different times on um, these three points, depending on how I spend the time, hoping to match the timeliness of uh, the previous presenters. And I've got uh, up there also a um, quote from Brown, Lauder and Chung, whose work I'll be referring to a bit, which uh, gives a little bit of a context to our discussion. Um, <clears throat> my partner, Lisa Wheelhands, also from Melbourne, regards this as a complete and utter barbarism and falsity. Of course, Nespresso couldn't um, replace a, a barista made coffee. But Brown, Lauder, and Chung's point was even if it technically could, 
that has not made cafes um, redundant. We still go to coffee. And so there is something more than simply instrumental reasons in our economic, social, and by implication, educational activity. So human capital theory is the foundation for, or a variant of it, is a foundation for the government's white paper as it has underpinned educational policy for the last 70 years in uh, liberal market economies, UK, USA, uh, Australia, Canada, etc. And you will uh, recall that human capital theory is a hypothesis that education develops skills, which increases productivity, which increases economic output. And that this applies at the level of the individual, a group, a company, a sector of the economy at all, as a whole. Human capital theory has developed as it's um, accumulated uh, impetus. It was first used to explain the economic gains from expanding education. And then it was used to explain why individuals and governments, etc., increase their investment in education. And then it shifted from descriptive to normative. This is why we should invest in education. And most recently, it's become prescriptive. And that, I'm afraid, is the white paper's position, the position um, criticized by um, Mr. Perkins and Dr. Clancy. But um, human capital theory was born out by the evidence only in very broad terms and um, has not reflected um, the actual relation between education and econ the economy more recently. It also excludes all sorts of um, benefits of education beyond its simple economic one. Neither does human capital theory explain the loose fit between vocationally oriented education and vocations. Aside from the regulated occupations, about a third, very often more, of graduates from apparently vocational programs work in fields other than the field for which the uh, program ostensibly um, developed them for. Neither does um, human capital theory uh, explain um, uh, mismatching between employment and education. It does not consider the role of the state and it does not consider the structuring of occupations. It um, ignores institutions roles and it ignores non-utilitarian education. In response, oh, as um, uh, over the last 10 years, the returns on education have plateaued. They're still higher, but they have plateaued. And the argument now is it's not education per se which uh, develops economic output. It's relevant education, skills-based education. It changes the driver from education to technological change. And for that, we need specific skills. And that is very much the foundation for um, the white paper. However, um, the actual evidence of the relations between specific skills and um, 
economic outputs is very patchy. I mean, the, the white paper manages to cherry pick a few figures, but overall, um, the returns on education are reflected by social and other factors. Um, Brown, Lauder and Chung uh, argue that the overall problem is not the lack of supply of relevant skills, but the scarcity of good jobs. And here's a uh, graph uh, showing the um, average um, wage growth overall uh, wage growth has remained flat. Um, so skills for job is trying to fix a labor demand problem with an education supply solution. And in response to one of the questions that was submitted by a participant um, before the webinar, I would argue that the broad policy should be to stop one's preoccupation with supply side education and consider rather the structuring of the workforce, the structuring of the economy. Now, of course, governments and liberal market economies such as the UK are loath to do that because that is where employers have so much discretion and they are loath to uh, circumscribe that. But if you want to fix a relationship between education and work, stop concentrating only on education, also look at work. There are other things we should do pending the revolution, and that is maintain our, um, our development, of employment and vocational skills broadly, as well as serving the other roles of education, developing um, students' capacity for further education and um, discharging a social role. Um, the white paper, um, invests a lot of effort, uh, faith in labor force planning. This is deeply depressing for me. Um, and they indeed, uh, the government proposes establishment of a council or whatever to um, forecast um, employment need. Well, here's an OECD uh, report analysis of labor force planning finding it um, inadequate to the task. And here's a study by a USA economist showing that, uh, finding, reporting that uh, labor force planning turns out. So you look at um, plans in the 1990s, in the 2000s, and you see how it came out 10 years later and you find wide discrepancies. If there is to be isolated shortages of this or that employer, allow the market to work. Allow um, employers to pay for the skills that are apparently in demand. So uh, this is taken from um, uh, an earlier writing. Now, um, I conclude with this point. Of course, the reason why I was uh, invited to this panel is because of the white paper's comparison with uh, Canada. So what's going on in Canada? This is from the OECD report, which the uh, white paper referred to. And indeed, Canada has a very high proportion of young adults with uh, short cycle qualifications. There's a comparison of the fields between Canada and England. I do not know why um, those uh, discrepancies are there. 
but they are. Um, Canada's high proportion of um, um, short cycle graduates was investigated by uh, my colleague, Michael Skolnick. And here's his explanation. This was uh, Canada in comparison with oh, other oh, OECD countries, and I've just put in the US figures. I add about Canada's colleges in contrast to England's colleges that um, almost all uh, two-year qualifications are offered by public colleges. There are a very, very small proportion of private colleges. There are shorter um, vocationally oriented colleges, 12 months or less offered by private for profit careers colleges, but they tend not to offer two year colleges. Colleges have long, well, since 1960, since they were established in their present form, been supported strongly by governments, both financially and in policy. And although um, particularly in uh, my province of Ontario, uh, um, programs are vocationally oriented and we don't have liberal arts uh, programs particularly, they are nonetheless broad. So the, the accounting and the bookkeeping uh, programs are not targeted to a specific job, but to a field. So thank you very much for um, your attention and I look forward to uh, your discussion. Thank you very much, Gavin. Okay, just mindful we've just got just under 15 minutes left. Um, looking at the questions, I'm going to ask um, each of the panel um, one or two questions that are related, uh, I think in terms of the way they could be answered. So um, the first, kind of driver for the question is about the contribution of the FE sector and the Green New Deal. Um, the, the full question was how can UCU publicise the contribution, but I think perhaps more appropriately around this table is what do you feel the contribution of the FE sector would be to the Green New Deal? Um, a third question was very simply, can we rebuild FE and lifelong learning without injection of new funds? I'm sure we've all got a pretty quick and easy solution to that. So, you know, can the FE sector uh, contribute to the Green New Deal with, with no new additional funding. And, um, and then lastly, I thought there was an interesting question which potentially could link here about the scope for an FEHE alliance amongst clusters of colleges for innovation and learning uh, technology that might be mutually beneficial. So um, if you want me to cl re clarify that, absolutely fine. Uh, are you happy to go? And if we're okay to go with Toby, Sharon and Gavin, is that okay? I'm, I'm happy to go along with that. Um, if, if I kind of fail to uh, answer them all, then please, uh, if you need to come back on that, then, then do. But um, I mean, certainly in terms of the Green New Deal, absolutely there would be uh, a role for the further education sector. Um, what we need, I think, farm that actually um, predates that is sense that there is an industrial strategy because you know, for further education and, and skills policy is far too often taken as an entirely isolated um, aspect in comparison to policy around businesses, policy around how we support businesses, policy around the investment in, in businesses and new technology. And so, you know, what we, we need in order to start with is a sense that government thinks there is a role for it um, in in uh, delivering an industrial strategy, and, and certainly two or three years ago, when we were talking along those terms, it appears in recent times that um, that the new uh, Secretary of State for Business, Kwasi Kwarteng, doesn't really believe in industrial strategy. And if, if the government don't see investment in the industry as a, really a matter for uh, government then there isn't, uh, you know, it's hard to see how they will see um, further education services as anything other than something for employers to buy. And so that's, that's I think, that their lack of an industrial strategy undermine their, their entire approach to this. Um, in terms of the broader question, can we have reform of the sector without 
um, without uh, an increase in funds or, or a recovery of the sector without an increase in funds, I think it's very hard to see how there will be a long-term sustainable recovery for the sector without uh, um, funds being returned, but simply returning the funds is adequate in itself. So there are structural changes uh, that I suspect are needed uh, as well. Part, you know, a lot of that is about recognising that the first education sector is an, a, a crucial part of, of the jigsaw, along with employers, along with uh, learners, along with local democratic accountability, whether that be through main combined authorities uh, or whatever. And that all of these, I mean, it's, for, it's telling that local enterprise partnerships are entirely missing from the government's white paper. Uh, the government seemed to think Chambers of Commerce could play a central role in that. I think that Chambers, um, there's some excellent Chambers of Commerce, there's some others that are far less able to do that. So if we can have some kind of consistent approach uh, across all geographies, then we need uh, a system that, that brings all of those together. So I think, I think um, an increase in funding is absolutely uh, crucial, but is not sufficient in itself. And, and I've forgotten, Alison, I think final question. Can you just remind me what, what that was? Sure, yeah, there was a question about the, the way that FE and HE could potentially work together, you know, either with it like a regional or local clusters of college and university um, to be mutually beneficial. Well, absolutely. And I've seen some great examples of where further education and higher education work together. I've also, I think more generally, though, many people in the further education sector would see it's been partnership with uh, higher education very much in the driving seat and I think it needs to be genuine partnership it needs to be a, a strong sense from government that they recognize a role for further education a role for higher education um, and that they want a collaborative approach they don't pit one a sector against the other um, and certainly you know I, I think there's been a strong argument made that where further education is able to um, deliver uh, degrees, but very much under the sort of uh, supervision and support of, of higher education that may, uh, when it comes to level three and four uh, qualifications, that that relationship should be reversed so that there may well be a role for higher education to deliver on those. Um, but that, uh, sorry, I didn't say anything about a Russian ship, just to uh, avoid any uh, confusion, but um, uh, the relationship uh, between further education might be reversed um, uh, in order to, to see further education as the sort of the driving force of uh, the graduate uh, education and recognising that some of that might happen in partnership with the higher education sector. So I'd love to see them work together, but it needs to be um, a, a, a partnership of equals, I think. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, moving on, please. Thank you. Hi, so just to respond, I, I, I just wanted to point out that one of the things that I think we need most, in, most crucially is, um, is a local strategic partnership that takes account of relationships between FE HE and community sector and that is focused on the themes that are problematic for all of us at the moment in which in particular um, the issue around as I've said already democratic divisions and also uh, other key critical um, issues facing us all are, are around climate change and the ecology so I think that this would be would tie into um, a broader adult learning strategy which we've recommended as part of the Centenary Commission as being pretty vital with a minister attached to that role. So it's taken seriously and that encompasses community learning, HE and FE, and, and also the kind of smaller um, institutions of adult learning that I've described. So I think it's really important that we have a strategic approach to this. Whilst ever we've got separate industrial strategies that ignore green issues, whilst ever we're ignoring the community and focusing on um, FE as monolithic institutions and HE as monolithic institutions with no democratic engagement at local level, and that includes HE, and I used to be head of community partnerships, so I know this is true. You know, we need we need a much more um, 
refined and strategic relationship. So that, that picks up on all those issues and is working um, collectively and strategically. I think that'd be my answer to all three. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah, monoliths for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, just before I bring Gavin in, just, just as a point, chats around the table, if uh, anybody wants to raise a question that um, they would like to ask the panelists, please use the raise hand function, or if you can't see it on your device, if you maybe want to put it into the chat box. Um, over to you, Gavin. Thank you very much. I comment on, I offer a comment just on one issue, um, and that is relations between FE and HE. Um, Australia has had institutions which integrate FE and HE since the 19th century, and it has since added to those, particularly in uh, regions which need or want both FE and HE provision but can't sustain two separate standalone institutions. And so they have um, integrated them. Uh, I worked for uh, 10 years in one so-called dual sector universities. No, two dual sector universities. I've worked for 15 years in two dual sector universities and I'm a strong supporter of them, but they don't overcome the boundaries between FE and HE unproblematically. And typically what happens is that the divisions, financial, educational, curriculum, assessment, quality assurance, funding, the differences between the sectors generally get replicated internally within the institution. And so you've just shifted the boundary problem from uh, the broader policy environment to the um, uh, various components of um, institutions internally. Nonetheless, they have advantages. Um, in Canada, we have a very few of such institutions and they take uh, Mr. Perkins point very, which was very well made that um, it's very easy for HE to swamp uh, FE and so relations must be um, um, established very carefully and um, the, um, the partnerships that work have the sector's roles clearly circumscribed by the relevant authorities. Um, I've observed some attempts at this in England, and I was involved a little bit in Thames Valley, and I found the um, disintegration of that partnership, um, painful, but um, a bit foreseeable uh, in view of the attitudes which the partners brought to uh, the association. And so that's got to be managed um, very carefully indeed. Thank you, Gavin. Um, there's this uh, chat just come up in the uh, in the chat box, which if everybody can't see, I just thought I'd read out from Mary Hamilton. I think there is a strong argument for adult lifelong learning to play a crucial role in addressing the disruption to children's current schooling, which I guess is something we, we haven't uh, picked up this, this afternoon yet. You can't catch up on two years missed on education in just a few months, but you can access opportunities to learn over a longer time span. And if those opportunities are readily and flexible, uh, flexibly available, the government might listen to this argument. Um, just with two minutes to go, if uh, in the spirit of question time, perhaps, <laughs> if I could go through the panellists with, uh, with just sort of 45 seconds about the, the catch up issue in FE and, and our role, where, where do we go in, in the next 12 months? Toby, please. 
Goodness, I think it's, um, I, I think the point that was just made there is absolutely right. There needs to be recognition that this is a long, you know, it's a long term um, uh, problem and, and it needs a long term solution. And I think it needs a much longer term uh, recognition by us as a country and as a society of the value of lifelong learning, because only in that way will we, um, will we be able to do it. But there's also a funding element here. Um, government are going to have to be flexible in terms of making sure that people who need to study again aren't financially prevented from doing so, um, and that uh, people um, and, and that colleges that might have um, people going on to the next stage of their educational journey without properly having bottomed out the learning in the previous stage and need support uh, with next year's students too. Thank you. Sharon? Yeah, um, I think we're, we're continuing our campaign to really push for the whole idea of lifelong learning and uh, just to share with you something quite helpful and it, it does seem to be getting a bit more cross cross party support as well. There's an article in the Yorkshire Post today about access to lifelong learning in colleges being key to skills led recovery from Robert Halfon and I think there's the, the general understanding that this has to be obviously lifelong. Um, and, and to help us support um, our, our younger students who have been so um, badly let down in many ways by, by the COVID experience. So we do keep pushing. We have a big media campaign going at the moment to try and really promote uh, adult and community-based education for, for life and for the whole community. So any support from anyone here to help us with that, we'd be very grateful for. Thank you. To finish with you, Gavin. Thanks. Um, I I don't know. Um, at the uh, start of the pandemic, um, many many people said, "What pandemic? We will go along as um, um, we have always done." And then, in the middle of the pandemic, as we are now. Um, there's a feeling that much will be changed and disrupted. And I just don't know. Um, um, I lived in um, a country which was badly affected by SARS. And I've read a little bit about the effect of um, the 1918-19 flu pandemic on education. And uh, likewise, during the middle of those pandemics, there was much talk about how it would change uh, arrangements fundamentally. But um, five years after, people said, what pandemic? <laughs> it kind of snapped back to where it was. And so I just don't know. I, I, I think it will be uh, interesting to observe. And as ever, the, the, the FE collective will build and will restore in the absolute best way we can with all of our, our wonderful skills. Um, thank you, panellists, for your time um, and your really thoughtful contributions. Uh, thank you, Rebecca, for your fantastic signing. And I'd just like to point everyone's attention to there are two more events as part of the Cradle to Grave 2021. That's um, Thursday 22nd, uh, 4 till 5, that's post-qualification admissions, increasing fairness in HE admissions. The next challenge as we come to the summer. And then this Friday, uh, one o'clock for an hour about academic freedom, which I know has been uh, getting everybody pretty hot into the collar uh, on Twitter and around the tables. So that's coming up. So go to UCU's page to register. Thank you very much for your time, everybody. Have a wonderful evening and enjoy the sunshine or the snow, depending on what you've got. Uh, for me, I'm going to go and have a dip in the sea. Good evening. <laughs>